I, I kind of discussed what she said already. Naomi Wolf, in the book called The Porn Myth, written in 2003, she come up with a term, came up with a term called pornographized. She says, our culture has been pornographized because of all the pornography exposure. I don't really like that word too much because there are too many syllables, pornographized. You know, that's not, that, it, there's a better word. Next slide. And it's called pornified. Pamela Paul wrote that one. And I think that's a, a, a better term. Our culture is pornified because we accept pornography as much as we do. Uh, next slide. And it's, a, it's, a, it's affected our relationships. Okay, keep going because I kind of talked about this already. All right. Now, uh, one of the things that, that Pamela Paul mentioned, or is that Naomi Wolf? Uh, yeah, that was, that was Pamela Paul. Naomi Wolf, rather. She said that feminists were wrong in their assumption that pornography would turn men into raving sexual beasts bent on all forms of sexual mayhem. Next slide. Instead, over the years, the pervasiveness of pornography has rendered men less sexually responsive to real women. Okay, next one. For most of human history, erotic images have been reflections of, or celebrations of, or substitutes for real naked women. For the first time in human history, the images power and allure have supplanted that of real naked women. Today, real naked women are just bad porn. Now, what I just did is explain to you why that is. With pornography, you have three reward systems that are coming together and giving you a bigger bang. The problem is, can you take it, let's see, you know, because Pornography prevents porno presents pornography as a high entropy state involving all kinds of variety. Okay, I mean, think about it. You've got keep uh, all right. Um, there's a there's a formula, and I use this for an, I use this formula to explain a number of things. It says expectation minus observation equals disappointment. In other words, if I'm expecting a car repair bill of one hundred dollars and I get a car repair bill of $1,000, I'm disappointed. How disappointed I am I? $900 worth of disappointment, okay? That's, that's the difference. Now the thing is, is that if my sexual threat, if I have consumed quantities of pornography, and I get used to that dopamine, and norepinephrine, and all that novelty, if I'm used to that low entropy sexual experience, and then I get married. I've got one spouse. Now, what, happen, what happens to the novelty I have a couple of years? Compared to the pornography world, you, there's nothing that was novelty, okay? Because you're not allowed to bring other people, you're not allowed to bring animals, you're not allowed to bring other okay, There's all kinds of things you don't do, okay? You, you don't do novelty. Pornography involves things that are totally out of balance for marriage, okay? So novelty thing, if you're used to that, if you're used to involving that, in your sexual relationships, then suddenly that's going to be gone. And guess what? There's something called withdrawal. Okay, what about taboo? You know, because if before, if you're doing pornography, if you're used to all the crazy things that, that happen with, the, with this high entropy state and all these varieties, God, if you remember from last week, about Leviticus, a lot of that stuff is not just taboo, it's, it's the, the, the word is abomination, toeba. That's the strongest condemnation God has. That's an abomination. So you can't do taboo. You absolutely can't do taboo. But what if your brain is used to it because you've consumed lots of pornography? Then you go into withdrawal. And your spouse is like a Tylenol 3 when you've been using heroin. Okay? You ever wonder why we have all these commercials for Cialis and Viagra? Is it because of diabetes? No, it's because of pornography. Okay? I get asked to prescribe that all the time, not because people have vascular problems, but because people have used so much pornography that regular relationships just don't do it. Okay? It, change, it changes the sexual script. That's why it is pernicious. It is subtly destructive. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, you know, well, 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 John 10.9, I think it was, where he says that the, 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 the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I've come to, that you might have life and have it abundantly. But that first part, to steal, to, to, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. To steal what? What are the good things? What are the blessings? The sex was a great blessing that God gave to us. He gave it to us as a form of loving communication between spouses. And he wants to destroy that. Pornography is an excellent tool. It's the most diabolical plan. It's very, very effective. Extremely effective. Now, 
what happens, people get married and, and, and if they expect that triple, that, that, that wonderful experience that they had with pornography, they expect that level of exhilaration because of taboo and, that, and, 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 and excitement and everything. And then they, 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 they go into withdrawal, disappointment kicks in. And that can cause some problems in the relationship, obviously. Next slide. Okay. When people get married, they're thinking, oh, I'm finally, I'm not going to be alone anymore, and I have somebody to meet my needs. My needs are going to be met. And, you know, the, the, all the single time, I've, I've had these longings, and finally, uh, they're going to they're gonna give me some fulfillment, and I'm going to be happy. Next slide. Now, in, in the book by, um, by Willard Harley, His Needs, Her Needs, um, it's a very good read, and I, you know, I, I do recommend it, actually. Um, I don't agree with everything he says, uh, and I'll talk about some of the things I disagree with him on, but a lot of his stuff is very good, and as you read through it, some of it's common sense. But there are some needs that we have that marriage helps to supply. Uh, for example, the need for affection. Oops, go, keep going back. Okay, yeah, right there. The need for affection, uh, sexual fulfillment, conversation, recreational companionship, honesty and openness, physical attractiveness, financial support, domestic support, family commitment, and admiration. These are all things that we would like from our spouse. Okay? But God did a funny, and he made men and women different so that we don't have the same top five. And that's cause, that causes some problems. Relationships require work. See... In pornography, they don't have to do any work. All you got to do is perform, and everybody claps. Okay, you, there's no work involved. In real life, you gotta work. Okay, in real, it doesn't not just for humans, by the way. You think only humans have to be kind? In order to have a satisfying sexual relationship, you have to meet the other person's need, and you you got to be on good terms. You know, you can't you fight somebody, and then before you make up, say, "Well, let's have it." It doesn't work that way. Okay, there's work involved. And even in, if, you, if you take a look at macaque monkeys, they have the same deal, all right? Um, you know, even though they are not monogamous, uh, in order for the male monkey to have relations with the female monkey, he has to pick out her cooties, okay? He's got to spend time gro grooming her, all right? And the more he grooms her, the more he gets, all right? He has to spend time doing stuff. There's work involved. See, pornography presents a script that is absurd where people just jump in, everybody just has these incredible libidos, and that's all they do, and that's all that's important. There is no relationship. There are no relationship problems. There are no problems. Nobody gets sick. No physical imperfections. That's a cartoon. That's not real life. So when people become adapted to the porn world, you're adapting to a cartoon that isn't real. Those people don't exist. It's like you're getting used to eating wax fruit. Okay? It, 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 it leaves you incredibly unsatisfied. The problem is it looks so good when you see real fruit with blemishes, you turn your nose up. Because real fruit has blemishes. Okay? And that, that's the deal here. Okay? So we have these needs, but they're not the same needs. Next slide. All right. In utero, men and women became very different. Okay? During those first few months, uh, men and women, look, boys and girls, look the same up until those, those early months. And then what happens is when the testes form, they release a surge of testosterone. Now what happens when that testosterone is released is it crosses the blood-brain barrier and goes into the brain. But once it gets into the brain, weirdly, it is turned into estrogen. And estrogen causes the male brain to form. Isn't that weird? That estrogen is what makes you a man? But it's true. It's true. Testosterone gets converted by the enzyme aromatase into estrogen, and that causes male brain changes. And so the desires of men and women differ based on going all... That's why boys and girls are different. We have male brain changes occurring in utero because of... Started with testosterone, but it got turned into estrogen and caused these changes. Next slide. Okay, so that the top five needs of men and the top five needs of women are different. Women, their number one thing are affectionate displays. The hugs, the back rubs, the kind, the, 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 the kind, uh, the kind talk, the, 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 and so forth. Conversation, honesty and openness, financial support, and family commitment. You know, putting the family above their friends, and bowling, and, and their job, and so forth, okay? And men put number one sexual fulfillment. And then number two, recreational companionship, and then an attractive spouse, and then domestic support, and then admiration or respect. 
So you see, the top five are different. So that's where the work comes in. You know, God said, okay, yes, I'm giving you these gifts, but you know what? You have to work. Now, before the fall, they probably didn't have that problem. But after the fall, we have that problem. So now, if you want to bless the opposite sex, you have to do things that they like, not that you like. You know, and after all these years, I finally figured that women don't like getting vacuum cleaners for presents. Okay? <laughs> Yeah, we love power tools. We like things with cords and things. You know, women don't like that that much. Some women do, but most women don't appreciate that sort of thing. And so in order, you have to give people what they want and not what you want. That's part of love. Okay? Now, if you take a look at that list. Oh, yeah, like my cat always gives me dead rats. Okay, he thinks that's, that's what he wants. <laughs> okay. Now, if you take a look at this list here, though, now think about when, when pornography becomes a problem in a marriage where you have a spouse, and you know, mostly it's the man, but now women are starting to get, have problems in this area as well, so I don't just want to pick on men. It, 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 it goes, this is really becoming extremely pervasive, and I'm telling you honestly, I do have women that are having problems in this area as well. But traditionally, it's been a man problem. But when pornography is an issue, we have some trouble here, because women, for example, have very high on the list openness and honesty. And that's a, good, that's a good desire. Men should have that on their list as well. Because in order for you to experience intimacy, what is intimacy involved? Trust and transparency. You need to be able to trust that person. You can tell them your business and they're not going to stab you in the back. And if you trust them enough, you can be transparent and reveal who you really are. You can talk about what your real desires really are without worrying about being hurt by them. Okay? Trust and transparency is very, very important. Okay? Now, if your spouse is involved in pornography, how likely is it that you're going to be getting transparency? It's very unlikely. This is something people do in the dark that they don't want their spouses to find out about. Spouses find out by, find out by accident by looking at their browser histories. Okay? And it causes major damage when that happens. And it causes trust issues. So a major need can go unmet. Okay, now when it comes to uh, looking at, the, 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 go back, <laughs> uh, with regard to sexual, man, man puts sexual fulfillment down there. If they are going to pornography for that sexual fulfillment, uh, you know, I mean, as a man or a woman, would you want to be second fiddle to a thing? To pornography? Nobody would like that. You know, think about it, it, it really is pretty disrespectful and inconsiderate to that other person. And so that, it, it can it cause devastating problems with regard to that, to sexual fulfillment. And when it comes down to admiration and respect, um, when one partner is involved in the porn world, and again, I've seen this with both men and women, not just men, but I've seen women involved in the porn, porn culture as well, who behave that way after marriage, it's very difficult to respect somebody when they are behaving in what you perceive to be an immoral fashion. And it takes that away. So. When people ask, how bad can it be? I mean, is there any, you know, from outside of the Bible, outside of the Bible, is there any evidence that pornography is bad for you? The answer is, yeah, there's tons of evidence. It's really not that complicated. It's really hard to argue with. It's kind of intuitive when you think about it. Okay? What I've tried to do is basically explain to you from a neurobiological perspective what's going on in our heads. That sexual script that we have can be rewritten, fortunately. The more you get away with it, the more you get away from pornography, the more the brain can go back. Okay, it is possible to undo some of that damage, but like getting off a drug, you have to stop using it. Okay? God does help. There are a lot of people who are ex-porn addicts. I mean, I've got lots of people in my practice, including some, ex, some current pastors even, who've had problems with this area. It's a very common problem nowadays. 